Hello, Scott. Are you there? Uh, not sure he's there. I'm, I'm here. He had to run back and do something for Alex, he said. He okay. Right back. All right. Um, the, big, the big dog. The big dog. I, uh, I uh, was wondering if you'd entertain an idea that um, uh-huh. I could. Hi, Scott. Uh, we could talk about the, uh, I, I consider the election kind of a farce. And, and oh, okay. yeah. You, Let, uh, yeah, let's start. Let's start with the election and the protests and all that sort of thing. Okay. All righty. And then, then can I do something else? Can I? I was. Um, I uh, uh, wanted to talk I think, about. I your, think. I think we're just going to have to uh, do it because I think Scott needs to get us going so we can return oh, okay. to Alex. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, we're 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 just going to we're just going to do it. We're we don't want to infringe on your time. Don't worry about it, Scott. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so Kirk, uh, do what you um, you know. Just get into what you want to talk about. I'll, I'll begin with the election, and we can. Uh, and okay. yeah, once well, you I'll you just I'll, I'll, you just I'll take off. We'll be fine. We'll yeah, be fine. you did. That's nice you to did. talk about all stuff too. So. Yeah, but no, I want you, I want you to talk about it. Just oh, okay. Yeah, no, I'm I'm saying. As we uh, as we uh, transition from one thing to another, make sure you get it in. Okay. you may be welcome to observations we have uh, Kirk and I are here Scott will join us uh, as time permits uh, today um, uh, Kirk uh, it was uh, an amazing week uh, I'm not sure amazing from a good point of view but certainly interesting uh, most members of the covenant don't vote I would say the preponderance of us uh, do not vote. I do not vote. I don't think you vote. No. Uh, and the reason we don't is because we have read Yahweh's testimony, and uh, he is vehemently opposed to uh, governments and uh, uh, such human institutions and only speaks um, very um, condescending of, uh, of human institutions like uh, government. And so we just don't vote. Uh, we recognize that the first condition of the covenant is to uh, walk away from your country. He doesn't mean physically. Uh, he uh, means to uh, to not be patriotic. Right. You know, the uh, president of the United States was welcoming the new president-elect uh, into town, and he began and says, you know, uh, we aren't um, Democrats first or Republicans first. We're all Americans first. And I want to say no. No, no, we're not. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, and I most certainly am not an American first. No. It would be way, 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 way down the list of, mm-hmm. of my uh, allegiances. No. I'm, like, I'm a member of the covenant first. Yeah. So anyway, what was your uh, take of the, uh, of the election? Were you surprised as, the, uh, as most everyone in the media and in politics was including the Trump uh, campaign team, who thought that the uh, the morning of the election, they thought they had, uh, I believe, a 15% chance of winning. And the most um, positive websites had, uh, had Trump at a uh, maximum of a 30% chance of, uh, of winning. Well... And I were having a little debate about these things because she's been listening, keeping up a lot more than I have. And uh, she said he's going to win. And I said, ah, the fix is in. You, you know, you got the Electoral College and you got the whole West Coast is going to mm-hmm. pick Correct. numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I was kind of, uh, the first time I saw some election results in the states that he was winning, he was winning like um, 65% to 29%, things like that. And I'm going, my gosh, that's a groundswell. So this well, that, but that, that's of course, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, of course, in, uh, in Midwest uh, and Southern states. Um, you know, it was interesting. Uh, um, I had thought that because of the Electoral College and the fact that 
that California, which is the largest contributor to the Electoral College, over 50 electoral votes of the 270 needed to win, that is, isn't even contested. So, I mean, if you are a, a, uh, uh, a Republican in the state of California, your vote not only isn't counted, your vote is actually counted on behalf of the opposing party. And what I mean by that is that that the 50, whatever it is, five, six electoral votes that go to uh, on the Electoral College that go to elect the president all go to uh, whoever won the majority yeah. of the uh, of, of the votes. Mm-hmm. And so if you vote for the minority candidate uh, because of the the number of Electoral College votes is uh, ascribed directly to the population of the state, your vote is actually transformed from being uh, for one person to the other person. So the person that you voted in opposition to receives your vote. I mean, it's the most convoluted and screwed up thing in the world. And, uh, you know, in the state of California, I think it was like uh, 65 to, uh, to uh, 30 and uh, in favor of uh, Hillary Rotten Clinton. Mm-hmm. And so you are you're just saying, <laughs> okay, how, in the, how do you overcome that? Mm-hmm. And and there was really, you know, you looked at the uh, the map, and I, I looked at it going in and said, listen, if the polls are anywhere close to accurate, and I didn't think they'd be accurate, I thought that 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 uh, Trump would do that would do somewhere between uh, two to four percent better than the polls indicated, mostly because there's a lot of people who would have favored Trump who didn't want to ex- to express the fact that they favored Trump since uh, Trump was uh, had such a stigma in the uh, the media and since those who claim to be tolerant are so intolerant of those who uh, don't uh, accept their mantra isn't that disturbing yeah it really is disturbing but uh, <laughs> so you know i thought that uh, all right yeah, he has a slim chance of prevailing in florida and he has to win florida Mm-hmm. And you know he'll probably carry the uh, the the deepest red states, but I mean there is no way the man was going to win Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania. I mean, not a prayer, right? <laughs> well, well, wrong. We're holding out because of the the Rust Belt, you know, where the, uh, mm-hmm. where the factories were. They were impacted by jobs and yeah. of work ethic. So yeah, yeah, it's amazing that it, right. that it was ultimately a. Um, uh, people who who had worked and who wanted to work, rejecting those who thought that the whole system should be based on entitlements. Yeah. And uh, there you have it. <laughs> there you have it. I mean, I, I uh, summed it up. I summed it up the morning of the election. I said, "Listen, I'm not going to vote." Yeah. But if I were involved in the political process and I knew that my choice was between a a individual who was right on the economy, but wrong on virtually every other issue, Mm -hmm. versus someone who was wrong on every issue, if my choice was between someone who was immoral and dishonest versus someone who was just immoral, Mm -hmm. it seemed like if you wanted to play the lesser of two evils, the choice was absolutely clear. Yeah. I. I told my students that the uh, what they may have failed because I had some a lot of crying ladies, and I had some minorities that uh, also were very upset. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Well, you know, people will." It's been my experience that people will, when everything if everything is fine, they'll vote for anybody. However, when you have bad economics and you feel insecure, you'll vote based on economic and security. Mm-hmm. And that was what they offered them. They, right. Uh, yeah. You know, the Democrats did not. Correct. They didn't feel safe, and they didn't have. They didn't see any economic future for their children, or themselves. Correct. Right now, I I am um, am not a fan of uh, of Trump. Uh, no, I think either. that uh, when given the opportunity to uh, make sense of situation, Trump almost always says the wrong thing, and he is uh, he is wrong. Uh, apart from the economy, I think he's wrong on every issue, and so I'm. Uh, I, the thing that bothers me the most about him, though, is that he's a nationalist. And the a nationalist appeals to to those who view the world either in in um, religious terms mm-hmm. or racial terms. Right. And I think that when the that the that he is this uh, um, the second of what will be a a series of referendums around the world. Uh, Brexit was the first of them. Mm-hmm. 
where nationalism or globalism is put at uh, at test amongst the uh, the voters. Do you want to be a a a nationalist or do you want to be a globalist? And uh, Brexit was nationalist. Right. Uh, now, in this issue, just like the Trump Hillary um, election, um, I didn't take sides because, well, I think that Trump is the lesser of two evils. Um, they're evil. both evil. They're both evil. Yeah. And in the case of Brexit, uh, uh, Britain is a really, really evil country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have no love whatsoever for Great Britain, uh, but I have even less affinity for the European Union. So, uh, you know, in that, yes, Brexit was the lesser of two evils, but I think Trump was the second of those. And you're going to have a referendum before long in Germany. You're, you're uh, having a, uh, uh, one soon in, uh, in Denmark. You'll have uh, one soon in, uh, in France. And so it is, there will be a series of these, and both options are bad. Globalization is bad, and nationalism is bad. It was it was funny before uh, before the show started. Mm-hmm. I was listening to Snowden, who was doing a broadcast from Russia, of all mm-hmm. places, <laughs> talking about morality. Uh-huh. And, uh, and he, by the way, he, is, he, he by the way doesn't know Yah, but he's about the most moral I agnostic I've ever heard. God, we got to send him a book. Oh, I know. Yeah, we really should. We really should send him a book. And I'm, yeah, I know. Yeah, he I, is I, such... I, you just want to stand up and cheer. I saw his movie, and he said, yeah, that's, that's, they would, it was exactly, that's pretty darn close to exactly the way it was, uh, as, as best as, as a drama could be. And I saw the movie, and, and uh, boy, I said, this is a patriot. I mean, not a patriot. I don't mean that. Yeah, take, let me take, scratch that. This up. is a courageous this, individual. This, this is a, hum, a human being here. Yeah, this is a human being here with, upright with yeah, with courage, character is upright yeah. and moral, righteous. Yeah. yeah, if there is a righteous uh, agnostic, right. it is uh, it is Snowden. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Snowden I think is an extraordinary individual, and he's he's a brilliant orator. And when yeah. you listen to you know, him, what he's said though was interesting because you brought up Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain has just passed. Uh, he was reporting the the greatest, uh, most overwhelming surveillance laws mm-hmm. uh, in the in the Western world. Right. Far greater things we wouldn't even accept here, and we'll accept just right. about anything. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, uh, uh, I actually look at the United States and, and Britain as, as um, Same and, 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 we, and we have to be careful on conspiracy, because the very fact that Trump was elected uh, undermines the whole notion of uh, conspiratorial claims to the White House, because he's We're not part of the couple. On, on something along that line, too. But Okay, all right, so we can talk about that. But the... Um, um, I don't know if you watched the most recent uh, James Bond movie, no. but in that in that movie, uh, it presents uh, MI6 uh, essentially uh, putting together a a worldwide uh, spy agency to control all people all the time, mm-hmm. and uh, and, well, that's, and that's and that's what he was fighting against, and it is uh, it is exactly what the world is doing. It's uh, it's amazing that Hollywood actually told the truth. Yeah, Nor- Norway and uh, Sweden and all are about to do the same thing yeah, as yeah, is uh, yeah. Holland and uh, the Netherlands. Right. I know the yeah. Netherlands. So yeah, and it's it's Maybe why. Germany. Yeah, by the way, it's why I don't do Shattering Miss anymore. Yeah, it's why I just figure it's life's too short. Um, it, they have put themselves in a position to manufacture whatever evidence they wish against anyone mm-hmm. to to disparage them, to silence them, to sideline them, and uh, and the the system is now so corrupt that uh, it does no good whatsoever to speak out against it, and to do so, all you're doing is jeopardizing your own freedom. And I figured, you know, there's there are things worth doing. Uh, including um, studying Yah's testimony and sharing what you learn, that aren't going to bother them. Yes, they they recognize that the number of people who are going to listen to what we have to to share about Yah's okay. testimony is so small, and those of us who in, uh, listen to it aren't going to be in their way because we don't care about what they do. No, uh, we're, we're, we we will expose we're, it and condemn yeah, it, but but but, we but we're you know we're not going to uh, pick up arms against them. We're not going to uh, to engage in uh, in battling them. Uh, we're going to disassociate from them, and there's not going to be enough of us to ever matter. 
Right. So they'll let us, they'll let us alone. And, uh, uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, Yosha. Mm-hmm. He didn't pick a fight with Rome. No, he, didn't. he hated Rome. Yeah. He despised Rome. But did he pick a fight with him? No, he didn't. No. No. No, well, he didn't. Dip, no, didn't. And just yeah, like I don't want to pick a fight with the United States mm-hmm. and it's a spy apparatus. But um, uh, and I'm uh, saddened that most Americans don't give a darn what their country is doing to them. But, um, uh, you know, there's things we're sharing and we're just going to focus on, on those. The thing that was uh, was uh, entertaining, of course, about the election is to watch the press have to admit that we're clueless. We don't have we don't have an absolute clue. And I figured that would last for a day or two. And they went right back to their ego um, uh, already uh, yesterday and today. The other thing I thought was interesting, uh, Kirk, was the uh, the protests slash riots. Gosh, yeah, that's bizarre. Yeah, the, the, you got them. You're sandwiched between uh, two of the epicenters: uh, Oakland, San Francisco, hmm. of course, from uh, the University of Berkeley. And sure. uh, and then Portland, Oregon, of all places, uh, has been uh, the most um, uncivilized. But uh, um, and so you're sandwiched between them. Um, but it is amazing that America's fascination with zombie movies and the zombie apocalypse mm-hmm. is actually prophetic. Yeah, we're witnessing the zombie apocalypse. The the zombies who are out stumbling in the street. In the dark. In the dark. Good always, night. yeah, always at night, always in the dark. And their slogans show that they haven't got the capacity to think rationally. You know, their, their favorite is love trumps hate. And yet, what are they doing? They're hating. <laughs> they <are laughs> They're hating Trump. <laughs> They're hating now. And, and the people who voted for Trump. <laughs> you know, it's, it is absolutely wholly and completely astonishing and then they're uh, they're they're uh, they're saying that that they're for inclusiveness and yet they're saying he ain't my president <laughs> yeah. no, we want to well, be excluded you pointed you pointed that out years ago and in regards to uh, you know i i I'm university of virginia we're intolerant of intolerance, intolerance. yeah uh huh uh-huh. and i'm going this is just too bizarre for words it's too bizarre for words it's it shows that people have 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 lost the capacity to to think and to and to or to recognize who they are or what they've become, those morons that are out there marching have absolutely no clue. It's a bunch of entitled young people who haven't accomplished anything in their lives that have no sense of who built the roads that they're marching on, who built the cars that they they rode to those sites. Who built the the power uh, grids mm-hmm. that enable them to be seen? Who built the, the the media empires that are reporting what they're doing? Who built the internet and the and the systems that they're using to communicate that they're they're going to have these have the, uh, sessions? None who of them have been in a storm? Who like yeah the the, the, the the tennis shoes that they uh, that they uh, love to uh, to sport and the cl- who made those things? They just come out of thin air. Who built the schools that. that are indoctrinating them? Yeah. Who built the trucks that drove the tennis shoes to the store or delivered them by the UPS truck? I mean, come on. This is, oh. this is like, this ain't even 101. This is basic oh. sixth grade. This is how the world works. I mean, what do you know? Yeah, yeah and, and I think that they are genuinely, but I, I really do think they're afraid. I think, I think they're right. absolutely panicked. I think they, they, they can't imagine... That anyone would dare do anything that was against their agenda. They're so used to being coddled, so used to to prevailing that when uh, and what basically happened here is uh, is is white men got so tired of being demonized and and sidelined. You can't go to a movie where it, where the villain is anything other than a Caucasian guy. I mean, even in the new Star Wars, the uh, the hero is a uh, a woman. The the assistant hero is a black fellow, and the uh, and the villain is a white guy. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way the story is told, yeah. and it's told on every I mean, almost every commercial is that way. And I think 
think that it's that the old white guys just got, say, you know, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. And it didn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. They say, you know, we're just not going to do this anymore. <laughs> Enough already. And, they, and these young people can't imagine that their imaginary world, and here they are touting how wonderful this witch of a woman was that was running for president, who was who was absolutely playing them like a fiddle and fleecing them. Yes. And nobody got it. And no one got it. Really? They really didn't get it. I, listen, I've talked to a lot of folks this week, and they did not, uh, they didn't get it. They they think she runs a philanthropic <laughs> thing, and, and money just flows in so they do good work. So, <laughs> honest to God. Honest to God. And, and and what am I going to tell my little little baby grandchildren? Um, you know, I, I heard that a lot. <laughs> my daughters and the females, and and as, my gosh, I don't care if there was a woman president. I, just not that one. I, oh, you know, God, I, really? <laughs> just uh, oh, for you don't have to hire Al Capone just because you want somebody from Chicago to run something. <laughs> I mean, God, I don't know. Use whatever analogy this uh, you know you come up with. But if your wife wants to run for president, I'll vote for. Her. <laughs> She knows she's smarter than to do, you know, work in that set. But not that one. Oh, Washington. But not that one. Yeah. Why in this whole debate? Now, uh, at some point in in the near future, I, I would like to talk about banking, and because you and Roy have been going on a dialogue with the Wizard of Oz. Yes. And I, and that, that you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you know, but most of our readers, and most of our listeners, and most of the people I know don't have a clue that uh, Frank wrote, Frank Boehm wrote that book about the central banking system. And I'll, I'll cover that in, in great detail, if you want, in some, at some point. But the thing that bothered me about this election yeah, let me let me share the uh, the stories that uh, on both sides of the equation of the okay. uh, of the Wizard of Oz as they were shared between um, uh, and Roy. Roy and I, and then um, um, we'll uh, we'll kind of go to uh, to uh, the the banking system as being the sure. the actual reason for that having been um, okay. uh, written. Uh, Roy sent me uh, last night, um, uh, and this was. By the way, an ongoing because he's he's down in Australia in the land of Oz, uh, it's what's called the land of Oz, and he's uh, and, and he was uh, bemoaning. He says, looking at the uh, the American election, he says it's just over for America. I mean, it's it doesn't matter which one of these two buffoons are elected, it's just over for America, and uh, and so uh, uh, you know, I actually expressed. I said, listen, if I were if I didn't have children here, I'd leave America. And uh, and I had some peep, some folks that didn't like me saying that very much, but uh, I mean that's just the um, uh, the truth. And then and then I uh, I wrote him a uh, this, uh, and I'll share this, and then we'll go to the Wizard of Oz. Okay. I said Roy, last night of score in a score of cities across America, from New York City to Los Angeles, from Portland to Chicago, including Washington D.C., we witnessed the zombie apocalypse. By the thousands, indoctrinated, entitled, ignorant, and irrational young people crept into the night and marched aimlessly through traffic on major highways, chanting mindlessly, demonstrating their hatred by hating those they oppose, all while angrily screaming out their opposition to hate. (laughs) And if that were not sufficiently hypocritical and ironic, oxymoronic. They championed inclusiveness by disassociating themselves from everyone who does not believe as they do. The media, which similarly trumpets inclusiveness while excluding everyone who isn't a socialist, secular humanist, internationalist, multiculturalist, and environmentalist, praised the zombies, saying that they were democracy in action. If You have the opportunity. Look at the hatred in their faces. Listen to the anger in their voices. Consider the hostility of their message. Read the contradictory words on their signs. And ask yourself why they came out at night. Why they congregated together. Why they blocked traffic. And why they cannot recognize that they are what they hate. It is easy to see how the Torahless One... Christians 
know as the Antichrist, will charm the world. Tell young people that they're entitled. Tell them that those who built the businesses that provide their fancy sneakers, that built their homes, their schools, the roads, the power grids and Internet with its social media are hateful, counterproductive thieves and terrorists, and they, the youth, who have done nothing, that they deserve more. And they'll stumble like zombies in the night to worship at the feet, at the deification of man. I was alarmed that two-thirds of young, college-indoctrinated Americans voted for a communist, Bernie Sanders, in the primaries. And then they voted for his dishonest and immoral rival in the general election. The future is stumbling before our eyes and is screaming in our faces. It is ugly. Anarchy is near. And if that were not bad enough, consider the fault line. The world is breaking apart on nationalistic lines, with nationalists opposing multiculturalists. It is dividing based upon class warfare, with the unproductive demonizing the productive. The reason that the pollsters got it wrong is because those who opposed the elitist and globalist candidate didn't want to be accosted by those conducting the polls. They realize that those who say that they are peaceful, tolerant, pacifists are actually the most aggressive and hateful. Those who are not politically correct are legitimately afraid to express their views to those engaged by the media. Boy, to America, where is the yellow brick road? And so um, to that, Roy wrote the following uh, last night. Those you described truly believe there is a yellow brick road leading to the magical world of entitlements, of safe places and cuddly socialism. They are too dumb to realize that the wicked witch of the West is actually Clinton and Oz is just as much a deceiver. You um, have put it so well. I doubt anyone could improve on the picture you have painted. The only issue is whether Trump is the lion, the tin man, or the straw man, or the wizard himself, or a combination of all of them. When I saw this movie as a child, I was terrified. Now, as an allegory of today's USA, this man writes from Australia, it couldn't be closer to the truth, and I'm still terrified, but for different reasons, of course. It is an interesting exercise to follow the idea that this film could be an allegory, not just for the USA, but in times prophecy. For example, the song Over the Rainbow reflects the promise of the rainbow following the flood. The Emerald City represents Yah's home. The Yellow Brick Road represents the path to Yah with all of its uh, attendant difficulties. The Wicked Witch of the West and her flying monkeys represent Satan and his demons. Dorothy represents the covenant members who do not fear Satan or his minions. And she also represents the covenant members who help those who are cowardly, brainless, and heartless. The lion, ten man, and scarecrow along the road of learning and understanding to Yah's home. The only one who doesn't fit is the wizard, who is overtly a charlatan and obviously does not represent Yah, unless the wizard may represent the religious charlatans who lead people away from Yah. Something to play with, wrote Roy. Wrote Roy. This is what I responded. And uh, before I read this, I, I, I want to make certain going in, and I say this uh, in this letter, that I'm not disagreeing with Roy. Uh, Roy is my favorite person to correspond with. I think there's a lot of things in Roy's statement that are accurate and true, and, and it's this is this is a different perspective on the same story. And you're and you're about to give us the third, which was the well, original yeah, author's it is, perspective. It is a uh, theme. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to share the Wizard of Oz story from the opposite point of view. Roy, yes, the zombies believe in Oz and a fool's gold road, which is fiat currency based upon debt that leads to an emerald city. Yes, a place surrounded by poppy fields. A place that is green and environmentally friendly, featuring featuring communal living of all of the little people, without industry or power grids, 
without cars or any means of escape, all meandering in circles, all chanting the same slogan. But based upon what happened on Tuesday, may I suggest that the wizard is Trump, the carnival barker, with a way with words, who loves to show off? And if so, the zombies are now afraid of him. The Wicked Witch of the East is easily cast as H. Rotten Clinton. But I see the duplicitous one, Clinton, more accurately represented by her sister, the fairy tale Witch of the West, who says that you can be anything you want or go wherever you desire so long as you believe. And that would make the Wicked Witch of the East and her legion of monkeys the socialist secular humanists of the New World Order, the globalists who want to scare everyone into compliance. They control the military with their drones and guns, after all. I even see over the rainbow as the storm arrives, not as it departs, as the flag of the zombies, representing LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bi sexual, transgender, and queer. It is being flown at their protests along with the Palestinian flag. Americans are the characters meandering off to Oz. Dorothy is Lady Liberty. It's modeled after Athena. The Tin Man, America's heartless military. The Scarecrow, the nation's unthinking masses. The Lion, it's lying in clueless government, including patriotism. Honor the troops, after all. All to fan the flames of false courage while denouncing the real thing, a willingness to stand up against them. And now the man behind the mask is the greatest carnival act of all. Trump. So while I enjoy your presentation, Roy, for the benefit of the covenant, and while I actually think everything you wrote is both brilliant and insightful, I'm reluctant to catch much of anything Hollywood presents as accurately reflecting Yah's family. The Wizard of Oz scared me to death as a child, and as a teenager, I used its slogans to dance away from my shyness. Now I enjoy it for the brilliance of the story and the way the characters are foreshadowed. It does present life. So that was my take on it. You, uh, you say the author had an entirely different take. Well, it's, it's assumed that this is the uh, the original take, and it's pretty pretty solid evidence that this was where he, he was coming from. But let me mm-hmm. let me start real quickly with uh, as a backdrop. Uh, you're familiar with Carol Quigley, the Joyce yes. professor uh, who uh, yeah. wrote Tragedy and Hope. Yeah, was, that, which is uh, the uh, Tragedy and Hope is the book for those that don't know was. Uh, uh, with the concept of a new world order and a conspiracy theories, and um, mm-hmm. he was a person uh, in, uh, who witnessed the conspiracy manifest and wrote a very complicated, complex book about how the conspirators work around the world as an elitist group to uh, to control uh, nations and uh, and peoples. And uh, Quigley was the principal inspiration for one um, Bill Clinton. Yes, and I was, I was, he so, was his mentor. Yeah, that's who uh, Quigley is in his book, uh, Tragedy and Hope. And, and Quigley, before I go right to the Oz, mm-hmm. uh, Quigley's uh, comment that uh, I made note of, he says that the, uh, uh, the world domination through, uh, through banking was the key, and the key to that, the key to that further was to control and manipulate the money systems of a nation while letting it appear to be controlled by the government. Uh, yes. And I wrote, the great Oz has spoken. But, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, what I, in light of all this euphoric stuff or this horror, mm-hmm. depending on the take you had on the election, uh, this is why it won't change. And I made a list of things why it wouldn't, but I went to Oz because y'all went to Oz, and I thought that was mm-hmm. the backdrop behind all of this. Is the Wizard of Oz was written about um, the banking and finance industry, mm-hmm. and it was a monetary allegory, and it was written when the big when the money question. Mm-hmm. was a key issue in American politics back in about 18, uh, from 1890 on until until 1913, of course, when the um, central bank came along. And William Jennings Bryant 
was he made his last stand against uh, the banking cartels, which were controlling the money supply. Mm-hmm. And he would be represented by the cowardly line, um, and he killed off uh, and decapitated the giant spider. Now, most people don't know anything about the giant spider, but in the book, the giant spider is the central bank. Mm. Or banking centers, and the yeah they left that out of they left it out of the movie, yeah, yeah, the giant spider, yeah. So uh, it had his tentacles and just about everything, and he was terrorizing everybody in the forest. And in this thing, and the book, he he's supposed to the cover the line is supposed to chop off his head and save all the people. Uh huh. And the people, the giant spider was described uh, was modeled on uh, the Morgan Rockefeller cartel, which was the first one before right. the central bank came along. Right. Uh huh. And uh, that was the new they, bank. They thing. created the central bank along with the Rothschilds. Right. Uh-huh. And, the, and Woodrow Wilson. Exactly. And the debate at the time between what to do was two, twofold. One was the a independent bank who's going to produce the dollars. Uh, and supposedly based on gold or whatever, but they were the ones who were going to have control in printing the dollars and issuing the money. Mm-hmm. And the fight was, and the reason uh, William Jennings Bryan was important, because he went back to the original Philadelphian uh, proposition where Benjamin Franklin's government was uh, pushed for the, that the government should be producing its own money. Mm-hmm. And... In that concept, what the what the whole concept was is the government would print the dollars, mm-hmm. and of course it would have a factor as far as it had to have some wealth there to back it. But it was backed by the government, mm-hmm. and then instead of uh, and they would loan out the money, I guess, through local banks, mm-hmm. and they would collect the interest, mm-hmm. and instead the government would be run on that interest rather than taxes. Mm. Okay. And that was uh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Now and now, of course, the interest goes to the cartel. The interest goes to someone else. Then yeah, the the federal re- the federal reserve. Yeah. yeah and now the only good thing I can say about of course with quantitative that. easing, they're they're making interest on illusionary money. Yes. It's just it's just stunning and the the game that they're able to play, and no one seems to care. Yeah. Nobody and they think and then the right. illusion, the man behind the screen, of course, right. is that you have uh, some illusion that uh, this is uh, a federal thing. But we'll yeah, that yeah, they, uh, the wiz- the wizard really is the central bankers. It is, yeah. Yeah, but you know, central bankers. It, it, to be really careful here, because I think mm-hmm. there's this tendency uh, to uh, uh, to do two things. One is to uh, blame banks for all the world's uh, ills, and I think that is wholly inappropriate. And also to to tie bankers into somehow the perception that the falsified elders, uh, the protocols of the elders of uh, of Zion. Um, uh, presents, yeah, which was, yeah, and so we have to be we have to be careful of, of both of these two because yeah. uh, it's, it's the only the only reason that the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world mm-hmm. have influence and power is because they they work in in a in concert with politicians and with militaries. That's the reason they have power. It's it's like the Roman Catholic Church. During uh, um, most of the past two thousand years, they had power because they uh, they worked in harmony with kings. So it was cleric and king mutually supporting one another. One without the other lost their power, yeah. and so politicians and militaries and uh, uh, and really the the, uh, the the productive part of the economy that that builds military equipment. The military industrial complex and bankers are all in it together. And oh, so yeah. to, just to point the finger at the banker is so, wrong. Yeah, you need to paint the, the, the banker, the military, the, the politician and the, uh, and those manufacturing the weapons of, uh, of war all are in cahoots with one another. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm totally on the same page with you there. However, in this particular instance, the Oz, Oz was, was an attack on that. Yeah, on the banks. On, 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 the, the, ba- on the banker, he right. had this, this right. spider. Obviously, was the right. Uh, right. Uh, the and you know, you look at the... you look at uh, Jefferson, whose uh, memorial, of course, is uh, is on the mall. Uh, third president of the United States, first vice president of the United States. Um, you look at uh, at uh, Jefferson, and the uh, the the thing that screams out is that Jefferson um, presented two evils. He says there are there are two things that that only two things that can rival one another for the single most negative influence on humankind, 
And the only thing that Jefferson said that was worse than an established military, and boy, what he wrote about established militaries will make your toes curl. And it is Thomas right. Jefferson so despised the the uh, the very thing that makes America uh, great. It's a military. Despised it with a passion and said that if you if America has an established military, it's over. Uh, but he said there was one thing that's worse than an established military. Only one. A central bank. Mm-hmm. And of course, America has both. Yeah, ever since. Uh, yeah. Was it, Jack? Yeah. That, they, you, know, you talk about the zombies that are mm-hmm. that are marching in the in the uh, the darkness, uh, uh, chanting their slogans. And that just when people chant slogans to me, it just says, "God, you are unthinking." How could you be so stupid? But uh, but it's kind of kind of like you know having a ritual prayer. But the uh, uh, the this this um, but to have a government that has military parades and praises its military on a mall where uh, where Jefferson is uh, is enshrined without listening to his words is it's just insane. You wonder mm-hmm. why aren't people able to think? I don't know. Well, you know, in in his book, he had the scarecrow was the farmers, the tin man was the industrial workers, mm. the, the lion was William Jennings Bryan, the advocate against uh, the banking system. Wow! And Dorothy was the archetypical American girl, who, believe it or not, they weren't ruby slippers; they were silver shoes. She had the power of the silver shoes, and she oh. didn't know it. Because oh. power was in silver or in, in real right. money. In real money, yeah. Uh-huh. And they were ruled over, you know, by the great Poobah, which was uh, the, the Federal Reserve chairman. Now, the Federal Reserve wasn't even there yet, but it was still the whoever the front man would have been for that, which uh, later is... Con- well, the J.P. J. P. Morgan the was the... Was yeah. A priest. Yeah, J.P. Morgan was, uh, was essentially the central bank before there sure. was a central yeah. bank. So that was the face he put on him. And then, uh, then the man behind the curtain, he was in... He was the, the he was on the secrecy and illusion, and it doesn't. Uh, uh, if you think about, you cannot get rid of say a Greenspan because he's appointed so called, but he was there for eighteen years, all president, four different, four yeah. or five different presidents. You, you listen to Yellen now, though, hmm? she is yeah. not a very smart woman. No, but, I mean, Green, Greenspan never impressed me. He's kind of a Weasley uh, guy, and. Uh, and I just found him wholly and completely unimpressive. Mm-hmm. But uh, you listen to Yellen, and and you just think, oh my God, have we have we dumbed ourselves down to the point that somebody thinks that this woman is qualified? And of course, it's also a woman that's head of the International Monetary Fund, yeah. a French woman, and and she, <laughs> oh, she's fr- she's frightening. Yeah. Here, here's a good quote. Here's my favorite Greenspan quote. I guess I should warn you, if it turns out to be particularly clear what I've said, then you probably misunderstood it. <laughs> 1988. <laughs> Report to Congress. The, uh, so now we now we know the real story behind the Wizard of Oz. The well, uh, the Ten what Man what was the uh, was the for, was the character. industrial worker. The uh, the the uh, scarecrow was the uh, the farmer. The um, the lion, the, the lion was that was was an individual with the with actually the the real courage to speak out against uh, centralized uh, banking and the banking complex having such influence in uh, in America, and the wizard was the uh, the elitist bankers uh, uh, using smoke and mirrors to uh, uh, to scare people and to uh, to impress them. Um, yeah, that was um, uh, that's an interesting uh, take on it, and of course that's the uh, that's the real take. So uh, yeah. uh, that's the way the story. Uh, but the, you know, goes. those type of characters can be. You can yeah, it's interesting too. They were silver. They were silver slippers in terms of the mm-hmm. the the difference between a yeah a, f- a fiat money yeah a fiat money and uh, and uh, money based on on real value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The- as a historian, though, you, you go back, or if you think about, if you like to read history like I do, I'm not a historian, but I certainly like to read history, and you, the, the British banking system was so scared, and you know about all the battles of the uh, War of 1812 and all was mm-hmm. more about Central Bank, a British bank. Right. You know, the British, the British were so frightened by this independent power that was growing in America from absolutely nothing. Right. 
seem like nothing, that they uh, they were instrumental in, in fighting the first Revolutionary War. In fact, they were financing both sides at one time, too. Right. And then when it came to the Civil War, that they desperately tried to get on you know, both sides of that one and did. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, of course, Lincoln went to the Greenback, so he cut him out a little bit. But uh, And then when he wanted to stay on the Greenback, of course, he was shot right after the thing. But good or bad about Lincoln, but that that's just facts. Yeah. But um, the the problem with the Civil War is uh, they sent they sent their people on both sides, financing both sides of the war, so they would stay divided because they figured two democracies or two uh, republics. But isn't that the case of every war? It is. Well, the, 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 is yeah, the industrial, the, the, the yeah, I mean, the, the bankers, the politicians, system. politicians recognize they galvanize power during times of war. And yeah. so they they like it. Uh, banks know that they uh, the countries go into debt, so they make money during yeah. times of war. And the industrialists who manufacture the weapons of of uh, death make fortunes in in times of uh, of war, so they like it. And yeah. those who engage in the military are all of a sudden come to the highest level of society. Oh. You know the Eisenhowers and the Bradleys and the MacArthur's, and so they come to the the Pattons. They come to the highest level of society, uh, and so they love it. And so, uh, you know, it uh, it serves all of the bad influences. Sure. War, inflation, massive debt, control. Yeah, and imagine we've gotten so desperate for war now that we're fighting a war in Syria where if you were to draw a lines to say, all right, who's opposed to who and who's allied with who, you would absolutely have to assume that the entire world's gone mad. I mean, for example, the United States' primary ally... In the Syrian war, the Kurds. And yet we have a contractual allegiance with Turkey, whose primary enemy is the Kurds. Can't stand them. Yeah. And so America is supplying the weapons to Turkey that it is using to bomb and kill the Kurds, while America is supplying the weapons to the Kurds for them to, uh, to go against both the Islamic State and, uh, and Assad. And yet the Islamic State is anti-Assad, and we're pro-Assad. And just yesterday, Obama said that he was going to start bombing al-Nusra when al-Nusra is the most effective force in Syria against Assad. And yet we're against Assad. And yet we're bombing those who are against Assad. And then and on top of that, we're, uh, we're uh, um, working in harmony with and yet demonizing the Russians. Yeah. As if we want World War Three, and then we're we're, uh, we're trying to to provoke war with China. Yeah, and so you've got China and Russia on one side, Europe and uh, the U.S. on the other, and and you have absolutely zero possibility of a good outcome. The continuation of Assad is horrible. The elimination of Assad is vastly worse. And and all the while. We're bombing the country into oblivion so that there are millions of refugees and that they're being uh, absorbed into Europe and the United States, fundamentally changing the culture and nature of, uh, of those places. <laughs> I mean, none, of this is, none of this is brought up in any debate. None of this was no. brought up by any candidate. No, Nobody no, you've got you've got Trump saying that he wants to bomb them some more. He yeah. wants to uh, bring Start back torture. Military. He wants to bring back torture. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Yeah. By God, the fact uh, what Snowden said today. Yes, he said, uh, quoting the government, he said, "Every inf- piece of information they ever have found thus far mm-hmm. has not produced one help, right. any help whatsoever." Right. Against any terrorist or that any of the things they claim that that's why they needed all the information. You know, before Snowden had his you know release, that. before Snowden had his release, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, well, I guess yeah. by, it was coterminous with, this, with Snowden having his release. When uh, uh, Clapper, James Clapper, who's head mm-hmm. of the uh, U.S. intelligence and uh, who's a real scumbag, uh, and uh, uh, the chairman at the time of the uh, Senate Intelligence uh, uh, Committee, uh, who's the outgoing senator of, uh, from California. When the, the, the two of them were confronted by Snowden's release on the, uh, on the NSA spying on Americans, they justified it by saying that, uh, that it has, in fact, stopped a, a terrorist attack. And the one terrorist attack they gave, I ended up writing 
volumes about this and spoke about it uh, 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 at considerable length on Shattering Myths. And the one example was a uh, a Pakistani double agent that uh, had been caught running uh, drugs. I think it was heroin. And that the CIA and the FBI had, uh, had rather than have him be prosecuted, had said, you know, you're going to be our informant. And so both of uh, this, this guy's wives reported that they had seen the plot to bomb Bombay um, and, uh, in India. And they had seen all the evidence and all of the plans to kill hundreds of people in India. And James Clapper listened to it and decided, nah, I'm not going to do anything about it. And this fellow had absolutely no plans to, uh, to conduct a terrorist attack in America. And so Headley was his name. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, the one example that uh, the team in defense of the NSA used Feinstein. was, was uh, yeah, Feinstein, was, it was of an individual who had no plans to conduct any terrorist raids in the United States, who had, in fact, conducted and led the most gruesome terrorist attack in India, which they did nothing about. Mm-hmm. And that they found out everything they needed to know about him the old-fashioned way, having nothing to do with the NSA. And these deceivers still denounced Snowden with that example. And the media bought it. You know, that one of the things I've seen these last few days is particularly Como and, and CNN presenting themselves as journalists and how, you know, they have a job to present the truth. He said, you know, we're not here to be popular. Of course, that's the only reason they keep their job is ratings, popularity. We're not here to be popular. We're here to be journalists. We, we, have a, we are devoted to providing a service. And it's just astonishing that there is not a single journalist in America not a single person who can look at the evidence and come to a reasoned, rational conclusion that can actually ask an intelligent question and can challenge the person providing the answer when they're spouting nonsense. Not a single person uh, in America questioned Feinstein or Clapper when they used that as the excuse. Not a single person. Not a single person in America accused James Clapper of, of, uh, of perjuring himself before Congress, because he made the testimony under sworn oath that the NSA was not engaged in broad-based spying on Americans. Now, how could you vote for those people? And the one person who is the real hero in this story, Edward Snowden, Yes. Americans on both sides of the aisle see as treasonous. And 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 increasing morality from Russia. I never thought I lived to see that. Yeah. That is... Irony at the best. Irony at the best. Mm-hmm. You know, I was uh, was reading a bunch of people uh, trying to to assess whether or not Trump will be good or bad for Israel, which is really about the only thing I care about in terms yeah. of America, because I realize America's uh, ten to fifteen years from now, America will be an anar- it will be in complete anarchy. Um, and there's enough reason to view him as a uh, as a foe, as a friend. You know, the first thing he said about Israel, he says, "I'm neutral. What do I care?" Yeah, I remember. And I mean, for him to say I'm neutral, it's like saying I'm neutral in uh, in watching a rape. You know, so, I mean, if you're going to be neutral in watching a rape, you you might as well sign up to work on on the University of Baylor's Board of Regents. They seem to be neutral on rape, but you can't be neutral on this issue. And then then he uh, came out and uh, said, "Okay, that didn't fly." So they said, "Okay, I'm going to move the U.S. Embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to uh, to Jerusalem." And he applauded the uh, the settlements, but then in his most recent speeches, where he realized that he had struck a nerve with uh, nationalist Americans, with patriotic Americans who who are opposed to immigration and opposed to to uh, this, that, and the other thing, that if he uh, had a speech that was akin to the protocols of the elders of Zion, that um, you know that that would resonate, and he gave that in Florida, and, and it boosted. His uh, popularity, mm-hmm. and so you wonder where is he How really? How genuine anything is, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Is he going to be better than Obama? Well, yeah. That's but that's like well, it's a, you it's know, a speed bump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not get carried away. It's a speed bump. Yeah. I mean, I keep the the best shows that you've done that affect me, my thinking. Um, there's been hundreds, but the the ones on Samuel. 
just in the back it just resonate so much you know when if you if you have a king mm-hmm. here's what's going to happen and then he yeah. says 12 things which are going to have an army take your kids take your money take yeah yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's so interesting that, plan. You didn't, that, yeah, you don't need it, any of this stuff. Keep some judges, get rid of the bad ones, get some good judges, and, and let's follow the, uh, the Torah. Let's follow the other plan. Yeah, you know, Yahweh has a form of governance and a form of uh, economic advice in his mm-hmm. uh, Torah. Most people say, well, you've you got to have a government, you've got to have a, a, a governmental and, and economic uh, policy, and he has, uh, he has them. Um, yeah. You know, you, if you read the, uh, the Torah, there's a, a marvelous plan, and it's, uh, it's presented in terms of governance. It's presented in uh, in uh, with the the judges um, and with um, with and Shamuel is the is the wonderful case of it. Uh, and so that there there are people who make informed decisions, rational decisions, uh, using know. using the Torah, Yahweh's guidance as their as their guide. And uh, in terms of economics, it's all presented on the in the presentation of the Yobel. But um, the thing that was just stunning to me is how Yahweh's assessment of government, of Shaul, where he says, listen, this is what the people want. But I want you to tell them that by choosing a government comprised of men, that this is what they're going to get. And then he listed these 12 points. And the first of them was that uh, he was going to take your sons and turn them into soldiers. We're going to fight for them. Then he's going to take your money and use them to make uh, war materials, weapons. And then once he t- he's took your sons, and then he, he took your money to create weapons, the very first thing he was going to do was to use them for his own self-interest. And then he was going to put together around himself other people, read the industrialists, the bankers, the politicians, and the, uh, the generals, who he would share a portion of what he had stolen to bribe them to being loyal to him. And then collectively, they were going to pursue war. And they were going to tax the people. And rob the people. And you, you read this and you say, why would any country, when God himself who created humankind and the universe that we're operating in, warned us this clearly, and we see it before our very eyes, why doesn't anybody care what God has to say? Why would anybody in their right mind saying God bless America or equate patriotism and uh, their religion? Yeah. Well, the Lord Jesus, you know, gave him that great miracle just this week on Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, a, yeah, it's amazing is that, uh, is that, uh, Trump is as phony as it relates to religion as was George W. Bush. Sure. You know, George W. Bush played Jerry Falwell like a fiddle. And, uh, and you got this sense that, that conservative Christian evangelicals should uh, support him, and they did. And of course, he sold them, uh, out. And the, uh, the issue here with, uh, with Trump is that, uh, Trump's religion is the dollar. Yeah, if if he has a religion, his power of power. Right. Thank you. you want to you want to know who who Trump worships? Look at the name written on all of his buildings. Trump's power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's uh, that's it's pretty pretty darn too obvious. What was most interesting is the is the single most uh, remarkable transformation of this election in terms of last minute was Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics went from favoring Clinton by 23% to favoring Trump by uh, by 10% in the last two weeks of the election process. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, they have, well, they would have to because the industrial states are tremendously heavily loaded with the Catholics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Ohio, oh, okay. Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These are heavily, heavily uh, Roman Catholic uh, places, and um, and yeah, they did. So, so when, when does the boat leave for New Zealand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, as I watch these protests and I watch the media talk about them, and then I watch uh, the um, uh, the those who lost their Obaminator and and uh, and rotten uh, whine about it, um, and then I, I uh, listen to Trump's s- just stupid responses to all of this. Uh, you know, my my instinct is, God, I don't want to, I don't want to be part of this. 
we, you know, do I want do I want to have my tax dollars go to a government that thinks it's good to torture, and that we can bomb our way to peace? Yeah, yeah, God. No. Uh, I, I, it, uh, you know, here's a president ran as a Republican, and yet he says um, we're not going to address or cut in any way any of the entitlements, which would be specifically Medicare and Social Security are off limits. We're not going to touch them. And then he says, I'm going to give tax cuts, and I'm going to substantially build the military. Yeah, which is already 25%, and on, on even the modest... Between, yeah, between the military and the two entitlements, Social Security and uh, Socialized Medicine. At least 75%. That rep- yeah, 75% to 80% of the uh, federal government yeah. spending. And uh, you've already uh, changed the tax code so that the majority of Americans pay no tax at all. And so, what in the world are you going to do? Well, if, if people, if you know, it's no, it does no good to lower a tax rate if uh, there's no jobs to go to to take advantage of it. No. And you know, and um, if you want to um, to write a very short book, write a book. Of, uh, of people on uh, on welfare, food stamps, and other subsidies that uh, created a business that uh, that was able to provide meaningful numbers of jobs. Yeah. If you find it, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, You could uh, you could uh, uh, conduct all of your research on that mm-hmm. and write the book. Well, in the uh, in the normal time the, for commercials on uh, one of the programs on GCN, that's like thirty minutes. Sometimes it feels. Like. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it felt like hours. Which is sometimes it felt like hours. Yes. Yes. So, were you were you surprised, Scott, by the outcome? No, not really. Uh, I didn't think he'd win, but I wasn't I wasn't shocked or surprised or anything like that. I mean, uh, it's something that I really don't care about, so I try and avoid it. And then I found myself glued to my TV at one in the morning. Yeah. So. As did I. Ditto. <laughs>